Hear now the promises of God. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious hand. Friends, we gather here in the protective shelter of God's healing love. We are free to pour out our grief, to release our anger, face our emptiness, and know that it is God who cares. We gather here as God's people, conscious of others who have died and the frailty of our own existence here on earth. We come to comfort and support one another in our common loss, and we gather to hear God's word of hope that can drive away our despair and move us to offer God our praise. We gather to commend to God with thanksgiving the life of David Alphonse Fitz as we celebrate the good news of Christ's resurrection. For whether we live or whether we die, we belong to Christ who is the Lord of both the living and the dead. Will you pray with me? Holy God, whose ways are not our ways and whose thoughts are not our thoughts, grant that your Holy Spirit may intercede for us with sighs too deep for human words. Heal our broken hearts made heavy by our sorrow and through the veil of our tears and the silence of our emptiness, assure us again that no ear has heard, nor eye seen, nor human imagination envisioned all that you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen. I now invite Tom, David's son, to read a poem, The Measure of a Man, and for our other speakers, you'll be invited up to the lectern to speak at that time. The measure of a man is not determined by his show of outward strength, or the volume of his voice, or the thunder of his actions, or of his intellect or academic abilities. It is seen rather in the terms of the love he has for his family and for everyone. The strength of his commitments, the genuineness of his commit of friendships, the sincerity of his purpose, the quiet courage of his convictions, the fun, laughter, joy, and happiness he gives to his family and to others, his love of life, his patience and his honesty, and his contentment with what he has. Let us sing together the hymn, How Great Thou Art, found in the Methodist hymnal, it's number 77.
invite Evan Taylor, the grandson of David, up to read Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cuppeth runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For those who will be giving remembrances, I invite you to just maybe Get, a look, get in position, but we have Eileen first, who's coming up, David's daughter, followed by Rebecca, David's granddaughter, and then Carl, a friend. Hello, thank you for coming to celebrate my dad today. My dad was a self-invented father. He delighted in his family, and you can see it in the 20 years of Christmas cards he posed us for. But he fretted he didn't know how to parent, having lost his own father at age six. He had few memories to draw from. He was often a quiet man, but he had a favorite saying, a job isn't worth doing if it's not done right. He taught us fortitude, to work hard for what we wanted, and the satisfaction of doing a job well. Dad wasn't around a lot during the week and often had weekend calls, but if he had a free moment, he loved working in the yard. He was a do-it-yourselfer long before the internet. Where he learned these new skills was never apparent, but he would tackle nearly any house project. He was a true Tom Sawyer getting help on said projects, and he taught any child with curiosity his skills. He'd work us all like a little brigade at times. We learned how to lift up old linoleum floors, burn off old paint, sand, then repaint, weed, trim hedges, shingle a roof, split and stack lumber, and even the fine art of operating a jackhammer to remove an old patio that we then wheelbarrowed to the dumpster. He wasn't all work, though. He loved the great outdoors, and he took frequent camping trips with us down to Baja, Mexico, over Easter break, and as far north as Victoria, Canada, one summer. Often there would be hikes to far-off lakes, miles of singing in the car and campfire with a game of hearts played by the lantern light. We have numerous stories of bear tracks around our sleeping bags and trying to decide whether toothpaste would either draw or repel a bear in the night. On our Mexico adventures, after a couple bumpy, dusty days winding our way south, our caravan would land on the glorious beach in Mulehe. Often, we were the only vehicles in sight. Here, water was more precious than soda or even beer. The dazzling blue ocean called to Cindy and I one afternoon, and miles from shore, with our eight-vehicle caravan barely discernible on the beach, we broke the oar lock on our dinghy. But Dad had been watching. Far out on the horizon, standing on the bow of a local fisherman's boat, Dad was waving his hands and shouting. He had spotted Cindy and I as a little speck on the waves on the Sea of Cortez drifting. You felt that Dad would always be there when you needed to be reeled in. He had hobbies, too. He was deeply fond of nature, and he created a saltwater aquarium long before salt solutions existed. And he would take us to the bay and tide pools and spend hours searching all manner of sea life to put inside. 
we would thrill to the crabs, starfish, and even a baby octopus that we would feed live brine shrimp. He had an interesting relationship to nature, wanting to honor it and preserve it. For years, we had a series of cow bones drying on our garage from an old camping trip. I think it was his orthopedic idea to put them back together as a full cow someday, but that day never came. We also had a dead owl in our freezer for years awaiting a date with a taxidermist, and that day also never came. But it was fun to show our friends our little curiosities. I felt like they were gifts of nature. We had an entire menagerie of pets at one time. Two dogs, two cats, three turtles, a chipmunk, a rabbit, four horny toad lizards, and a pigeon recouping from a wing injury. He taught us to revel in nature as he did and to relish our beautiful world. He enjoyed skiing, snow, as well as water skiing, which was my favorite. Early in his Hawaii days, he developed a talent for water skiing and movies exist of him standing on a stool, placed on top of a disc, doing 360s, all while being pulled by the boat. During high school, my high school years, he'd tap my door in the dark, and that was all I needed to get up and go. He would take most comers Thursday mornings, well, take all comers most Thursday mornings at 5.30 in the morning, summer or winter. He just needed to bring the donuts. One of his fondest vocations was as a gentleman farmer, first in the backyard, eating up ever more of our play space later buying 40 acres to plant his bulbs and orchard in Julian. He was a thrifty farmer with nary a fruit to go uneaten, no matter the appearance. He ate all of his protein, no matter, mo the, no matter the, mo the, <laughs> he ate all of his proteins, never mind the aphids, steamed firmly onto the broccoli. For him, that was extra protein. Which brings me to dad's love of food. Whether it be the authentic bratwurst from the true German store or the freshly caught 40 pound halibut, dad loved food, particularly if he had a hand in bringing it to the table. He made a mean sourdough starter that provided years of delicious blueberry pancakes. And his recipe for beef jerky would put a competitor out of business if he'd ever gone public. There was the sweet candied figs and his homemade English toffee so dear to him. And he had a love of ice cream. And I believe that we were the only family in town that bought it by the three gallon container. My dad knew how to live life large. And he knew how to die. My dad died holding my mother's hand. And the night before, he was surrounded by family as we sang those old car songs. His eyes were bright and glistening, and he tried to mouth the words with us. We laid my dad out in his Hawaiian shirt, and his granddaughter played a beautiful farewell to the that old Hawaiian song on the ukulele for him. I will miss his wry jokes, his warm, enveloping hugs, his beautiful baritone singing voice, his big belly laughs, his generous spirit, and his toasts at family gatherings. He may not have known how to be a father, but my dad sure knew how to make a family. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Eileen, that was beautiful. I'm very honored to say a few words about my grandfather, who I call Granddad. When I started reflecting on what I wanted to say today, my mind was filled with many happy memories. 
sunny visits to San Diego with granddad and his garden, and snowier times in Boise with granddad dressed in his very finest Christmas suit. I remember dominoes, boogie boarding, building snowmen, Ohio State football, and gathering around to share grandmom's wonderful cooking. But most of all, I remember laughter and joy. My granddad had many accomplishments in his lifetime, both personally and professionally. But to me, he was granddad. A steady, loving, guiding presence, always there to greet you with a big giant bear hug and put a smile on your face. Above all else, granddad prioritized family. I look back at these joyful times and recognize that my granddad went above and beyond to create special memories for us kids. My favorite type of morning was waking up to the smell of sourdough pancakes, wandering down to the kitchen to granddad reading the newspaper and sipping coffee. As soon as he saw you, he would cheerfully proclaim, well, hello, sleepyhead. He would set down his paper and spring into action to chef up a plate for you. Of course, he had woken up hours before to make sure breakfast was ready for everyone. Granddad knew the importance of quality time with loved ones. He was quick to suggest board and card games, engaging us in spirited competitions that would often run right up to our bedtime. He loved to celebrate birthdays and the holidays. And as Aunt Eileen said, I can still hear his baritone voice harmonizing with Grandmom as they sang happy birthday and Christmas carols. You know, your grandmom's in the church choir, he would say to me, beaming. My granddad cherished my grandmom, and their marriage set a beautiful example of enduring love and appreciation for each other. It's a special thing to watch your grandparents married for over 60 years, hold hands while walking to their morning coffee shop. My granddad loved her and the family they built together fiercely. It was this love that brought so much joy to our lives. Granddad encouraged us to learn and challenged us to grow. One afternoon when I was in middle school, I got home and was excited to share what I had learned in religion class that day. I knew my granddad was a man of God, and I figured this would be easy to repeat to him. He would pat me on the back for being a good Christian, and we would move on to the next topic. Instead, I was met with some of the toughest questions about faith I had ever been asked. I remember sitting on the porch of my childhood home, looking out at the yard, trying to come up with a response. When granddad turned to me, looked me straight in the eyes, and said, I struggle with these things too. And we sat there in wicker chairs and had one of the most impactful discussions about life and religion that I've ever had. It was in that moment that I realized that adults might not have all of the answers, and that was okay. Granddad encouraged me to consider different perspectives, think critically, formulate what answers I could for myself, and to never stop asking questions. More than 15 years later, I still think about this conversation and Granddad's willingness and ability to engage with me, a child at the time, on a deeper and meaningful level. In the last few years, even as Granddad struggled with his memory and didn't always have a lot to say, the giant bear hugs remained a constant you could feel just how much he loved you. He was our cornerstone, anchor, and patriarch. I miss him so very dearly, but I am comforted in knowing that his legacy of kindness and love lives on in my grandmother, my dad, my sisters, my aunts and uncles, and my cousins. I truly see his reflection in each of them. I'll end by saying the same words that were my last words to him. I love you, Granddad. Thank you for everything that you've done for me and for our family. Thank you.
David A. Fitz, MD. David and I became partners when I joined the orthopedic medical group in January of 1989. We found it very easy to communicate between the two of us. And after seeing patients in the office, we often would sit down and talk about either patients that had diagnoses that were difficult to handle or weren't improving as much as we would like to have them improve. We practiced together for 20 years and David was an indispensable assistant to my surgeries and I was an assistant to many of his surgeries. I think that when we assisted each other in surgery, we provided a different perspective, which in my opinion, was beneficial to our patients. Since we both belong to the North American Spine Society, the San Diego Orthopedic Society, and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, we attended many meetings together. On the recreational side of orthopedics, David and I participated in many orthopedic-sponsored ski trips, including trips to California, Utah, and Colorado. In addition to assisting each other in our practice of orthopedics, we had an extensive and busy social life. David always made us feel very comfortable. He had a great sense of humor and loved telling jokes. Margaret and I had many enjoyable times with David and Mary at their cabin in Julian. This could be something as energetic as hiking in the hills and the mountains or an afternoon pressing cider on fresh apples from David's orchard. One day, David suggested that we take up ballroom dancing lessons. Uh, I was not particularly interested in ballroom dancing, but I said I would go home and ask my wife, Margaret, if she was interested. To my surprise, she said, I'd love to. That led to many fun times on the dance floor, accompanied by dance lessons at Champion Ballroom, culminating with dinners in Hillcrest. Our dancing led to Cotillion, which has six formal dinner dances yearly, which we truly enjoyed, along with Mary and David. Our social mainstay, however, was the Old Globe Theater on a regular basis. Years of great entertainment, routinely accompanied by dinner and wine, but most importantly, the enjoyment of being with David and Mary. You may have heard nothing but positive things about David, but I am here now to tell you the one very negative and disappointing part of David Fitz. Ohio State Buckeyes and uh, Michigan Wolverines. I had to hear again and again how great they were. I would say my time with David, both from an orthopedic and a social standpoint, was most rewarding. I have great memories of our time together, and I will miss him dearly. Thank you.
I now invite Galen up to read our gospel reading from the Gospel of John. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. For were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way I am, where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Do not let your hearts be troubled. In the scripture that comes from the Gospel of John, Jesus is talking to the disciples and he's preparing them for his death. And I love Jesus. I love him a lot. But he seems a little out of touch in this scripture as he tells them, do not let your hearts be troubled because the disciples have troubled hearts. And rightfully so. They are preparing to be without their teacher in this life, their friend, their confidant, the person that they've spent years of their lives with will be gone. And their hearts are troubled, and rightfully so. And here we are today. We gather with troubled hearts, laden heavy with grief as we honor and celebrate the life of Dr. David Alphonse Fitz, a beloved father and husband and grandfather and son and brother and friend and surgeon. And like the disciples, your hearts may be troubled, and rightfully so. Thomas asked Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Thomas's question is one that maybe many of us have today. How can we know to go forward? How can we go forward in grief, O oh God? How can we move away from our sadness, O oh God? How can we know the way when our hearts are troubled? How, O oh God, can we know the way? While I didn't know David personally, I did have the privilege of speaking to his wife, Mary, and his daughter, Sydney, in preparing for today's service, and it sounds like David was a man who lived. And he, too, knew what it was like to live life with a troubled heart because at the age of six, he lost his father. David had a troubled heart. But despite losing his father at such an early age, he became the father that he dreamed of, one who laughed and played, one who protected and provided, one who loved and encouraged, one who made time and space for experiences, one who created magic and memories. David may have had trouble in his heart, but he didn't let that trouble stand in his way. People in his hometown of Sandusky, Ohio, thought that David would build skyscrapers, the skyscrapers of Sandusky because he loved the mechanics of things and how they worked. He had questions and he sought answers, but little did they know that he wouldn't build skyscrapers, that he would use his gifted hands to rebuild people as an orthopedic surgeon. David didn't let the trouble in his heart stand in his way. He was a gifted surgeon, one who put people back together, but I must add that he might not have been so successful of a surgeon if it wasn't for a young woman named Mary, who was a student who worked in the library at the Ohio State University. I hear you have to add the the in front of it who against the rules let him borrow a medical journal to study for his upcoming test the next day, and he passed. And the rest is history. David wanted to help people. 
He wanted to repair that which had been broken. He wanted to put the pieces of the puzzle back together to enhance the quality of life for others. His hands were strong and steady, but his heart, even when it was troubled, was compassionate and gracious. He wanted to do good, and he did. David's world was bigger than Sandusky as he traveled to every continent across this globe, and yet he still carried those memories and those experiences with him from Sandusky throughout his life. He and Mary were adventurers together in this life, and together with their hands and with their hearts, they built a beautiful family. They shared 66 years together of life, 66 years of life's ups and downs, of life's hills and valleys, of life's trials and triumphs, of life's joys and sorrows, 66 years, five children, 10 grandchildren. David didn't build skyscrapers, but he did build a legacy a legacy that's rooted in love and in laughter that lives on in each and every one of you. David, his heart was troubled, but he didn't let that trouble stand in his way. And so how, oh God, do we move forward with a troubled heart? Well, you do what Dr. David did. You keep living. You make time for those that you love even when your schedule is busy. You care for those in need. You repair that which you did not break. You dance. Even if you have to get lessons like no one is watching, you share your gifts with the world. You never stop learning. You ask deep questions, and whatever you do take apart, you find a way to put it back together and make it even stronger and better. You explore the world. You create adventure. You believe in good, and you dare to trust God. You remember that people matter. You dare to dream. You find new hobbies no matter your age. You plant new seeds. You tend to the garden of your heart. You sing the melody of your soul. You give graciously. You never stop learning. And you live your life today not waiting for what may come tomorrow. And you don't let the trouble that may be in your heart stop you from living and loving. I recently watched an interview with actress Regina King, and she was discussing the passing of her own son, Ian. And she said these beautiful words, grief is love that has no place to go. The trouble in your hearts today is the deep love that you feel for David, whatever relationship that you had with him. And so as you continue to navigate your way forward with a troubled heart, I encourage you to remember that trouble doesn't last always. And that even in your trouble, you can keep building the life that God is calling you to because love never dies. Love never dies. And so may the trouble that you feel in your hearts today move you to live and to love more abundantly. May you know that life is worth living even when the trouble hits. And so to a great man, Dr. David Alphonse Fitz, we all say well done, good, and faithful servant. You did what God called you to do, to live your life despite the troubles that come. May we all be blessed and encouraged and inspired to do the same. Amen.
Will you pray with me? Precious Lord, our strength and our redeemer, giver of life and conqueror of death, we praise you with humble hearts, with faith in your great mercy and in your wisdom. We entrust David into your eternal care. We praise you for your steadfast love for him all of his earthly life. We thank you for all of those who loved him. We thank you that David is free of all sickness and sorrow, and that death itself is past, and he is entered the home where all of your people gather in peace. And so into your precious hands, O oh God, we commend your servant, David Alphonse Fitz. Acknowledge, we pray, a sheep of your own flock, a son of your own redeeming. Receive him as we know that you already have into your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the company of saints in the light. And now, O oh God, we pray for ourselves, that when we have served you in our generation, that we too may be gathered with those who have gone before us, having the testimony of good conscience and the communion of your holy church and the confidence of a certain faith and in comfort of saving hope, and in favor with you, our God. We pray this prayer in Christ's name, and we pray in his words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. David didn't seem like a man who was worried about tomorrow. He spent his time living today. So beloved children of God, as we depart from this place, may we go with God's peace that passes all understanding. And I ask that God would keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of love and in Christ Jesus, our risen Savior. May the God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing so that 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, your hearts may forever abound in hope. Amen. You are invited to remain seated as we hear the prelude together.
off of Linder Hall, Linder Lounge, and in the patio area.